Good afternoon, everyone. We are about to begin, so if you could take your, your, your seats, that'll be lovely. I would, I would appreciate, as would our um, panel, who one of whom is two, three, are about to leave from here and go into rehearsing. If it is possible, if you would please wear your masks, um, everyone would appreciate that. Thank you so much. So I think we can begin. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. A very, very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us here um, at ECHOSOC at the uh, United Nations headquarters in New York. And also a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us online, wherever you may be around the world. Uh, we're so pleased to have you here. My name is Tracy Peterson, and I manage the uh, Holocaust in the United Nations Outreach Program in the Department of Global Communications here at headquarters. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, as is our way, we, we like to encourage participation and that this becomes a conversation. And so we really do want you to feel comfortable to ask questions, to put comments. Those of you who are in the room, We'll do the tried and tested old way of raising your hand and a mic will be brought to you. There's a question and answer section at the end after the panelists have spoken. And then for those of you who are joining us online, there is this very clever thing called Slido, which I'm thinking might be projected behind me. Uh, not yet, Bo. Would you mind putting up the Slido for us? Okay. All right, so how this very clever thing works, and those of you in the room can do the same thing. You either um, take your cell phone and point it at the QR code and scan it, and it'll take you to the platform, or you can type in the number, the, um, hashtag 1946920. Um, for those of you, everybody who registered, whether you're here with us today or whether you're watching online, there was also a link to the Slido platform. And you can pose your questions, put your comments there, and our team will be monitoring it all the time, and we will take those questions and comments in the Q&A section after the panelists have spoken as well. So, I think many will know that on the night of the 9th into the morning of the 10th of November 1938, across Nazi Germany, annexed Austria, and the Sudetenland. Jewish people, their places of worship, their homes, their businesses came under attack. Across the country, synagogues were desecrated and set alight, shops' windows smashed and vandalized, and people terrorized. Some 30,000 men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Their crime, they were Jewish. This was the first time that being Jewish was grounds for arrest. The government had sent notice to the police and fire departments to intervene only if so-called Aryan buildings were in danger. The Jewish communities were forced to clear the streets of the glass from the shattered shop windows and to pay a fine of one billion Reichsmark. This night of terror became known as Kristallnacht, literally the night of crystal or the night of broken glass, in reference to the streets and pavements that were covered with the glass from the shattered windows. The name Kristallnacht does not capture the true impact of the night. And so increasingly, the practice is now to refer to the events of the 9th and 10th of November 1938 as the November Pogrom. The November Pogrom marked an escalation and radicalization in uh, the anti-Semitic violence of the state. The numbers of Jewish people trying to leave Europe soared. Sadly, and to the eternal shame of the world, the countries of the world did not respond with compassion. Instead, 
Immigration quotas became ever more restrictive, making it virtually impossible to leave Europe. We know the events that followed. Less than a year later, Germany invaded Poland, and the Second World War began. And when looking at the history, it is hard to remain with the victims. Let me explain. It's hard for us to try and hear their voices, to the, view the history from their perspective. And so we need to consider always how they anticipated, how they responded, what they did as the violence increased against them. And now I ask you to join me and to take a moment of silent reflection and remembrance. Thank you. Today, we meet to speak about music and the Holocaust, history, memory, and justice. Against the backdrop of the terror, the deadly violence, and tragedy of the Holocaust, it is indeed hard to think of music. Today, we consider the place of music in the history of the Holocaust, and the relationship between music and the Holocaust for contemporary musicians. And we have a wonderful panel with us to lead us in discussion. Uh, sitting to my far right is historian Jay Grimes. And then next to me, next to me is conductor and musician Noreen Green. To my left, conductor, composer, and musician Victoria Bond. And to Victoria's side, violinist Rene Jollers. I'd like to turn to Jay to begin our discussion. Jay is a musicologist, author, and professor of musicology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He is the author of Violins of Hope, Instruments of Hope and Liberation in Mankind's Darkest Hour. Jay has spoken at significant public venues, including the Wheel Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall. We're very pleased to have you with us, Jay and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to start off this afternoon by discussing some of the roles that music played during the Holocaust. And we will find that that relationship between the victims and the music is often quite complex. In many cases, the victims used music as a form of spiritual resistance through making music, whether it was singing or at times playing instruments, music provided a way for them to conjure up a sense of normalcy and to hang on to their sense of cultural belonging. In my book, Violence of Hope, I write about Erich Weininger. He was a Viennese butcher and an amateur violinist. And shortly after Nazi Germany annexed Austria in 1938, he was arrested, beaten, and taken to the Dachau concentration camp. There, he and 13 other musicians did something quite extraordinary. They formed a clandestine orchestra. Gatherings of any kind were strictly forbidden in Dachau, punishable by death. But it was known that on Sunday afternoons, the guards would at times be lax in their supervision. So the musicians would put together concerts in an unfinished latrine building that was being unused. There was room enough for the 14-piece ensemble and maybe 20 to 30 audience members. And so they would play these short concerts of maybe 15 minutes in length of popular classical tunes and sometimes newly composed music, and we'll hear a little bit about that in a few moments. They would play short concerts to allow as many of their fellow prisoners to cycle through as possible, playing several concerts in the afternoon. And for just those few moments every Sunday afternoon, for the musicians and their fellow prisoners, they could imagine 
being in a better place at a better time. At times, music actually saved lives. In October of 1940, Fievel Vinegar and his family were taken on a death march through Romania. The government of Romania had decided to round up their entire Jewish population and march them towards Transnistria, which they had recently annexed. Those who did not die along the way, as did Fievel's uncle and mother of exposure, exhaustion, starvation, and brutality, were left in Transnistria with no food and no way of providing for themselves. In the Shargarad ghetto in Transnistria, Fievel managed to get his hands on a violin. And he started playing that instrument at parties hosted by the Romanian officers and Ukrainian farmers. These were lengthy events. They would sometimes go on two or three days without stop. And Fievel would play the entire time. And the agreement was, whatever food was left over when the party was finished, Fievel could take that back to his family in the ghetto. And so by playing the violin, by making music, Fievel was able to not only stay alive himself, but to save the lives of 16 family members and friends, including his wife and his young daughter. <clears throat> Those types of stories can be very inspiring. Uh, it's a very positive feeling, but one of the things I want to leave you with is this relationship is not always so happy. There were times when music was used for more nefarious purposes. For example, in the orchestras that played in many of the concentration camps. In the large complex that we refer to collectively as Auschwitz, there were orchestras in the main camp, orchestras in the men's and women's camps of Birkenau and throughout the various subcamps. These were ensembles composed of prisoners. Unlike Erich Weininger in the early days of Dachau, they weren't coming together for themselves and playing music of their choice for their own edification. They were required to play as part of their forced labor. The primary roles of these orchestras was to play at the camp gates every morning as their fellow prisoners were marched out in regular rows of five. The German marches they were required to play established a beat that instilled what the Germans referred to as marching discipline meaning they helped the prisoners stay in step. After the last of the prisoners had gone by, many of the musicians would put away their instruments and they too would go out for forced labor. But they would be the last ones out and the first ones back at the end of the day to set the orchestra back up and start playing those marches again. In addition to having slightly less work detail, their privileged status in the camp as members of the orchestra sometimes allowed them to get slightly warmer uniforms or slightly more food. And while membership in the orchestra by no means guaranteed one's survival, for some members of the orchestra, those small privileges gave them just the advantages they needed to stay alive for one more day, and then one more day, and then one more day, until ultimately they outlived the Nazi regime. As one white might imagine, the relationship between the orchestra members and the rest of the prisoner population was at times complex. Primo Levi in Survivor at Auschwitz recalls being in the infirmary in Auschwitz III and they could hear the sound of the orchestra kind of wafting through the air, the bass drum and cymbals, little scraps of melody depending on how the wind was blowing. And he remembers looking out at his fellow victims, fellow prisoners, and he writes, we all thought this music was infernal. What an insult to hear such schmaltzy music in such a desolate place. Other survivors recall feeling gratitude for their fellow prisoners playing these marches, helped them put a little pep in their step as they marched back into the camp at the end of the night. So they did not appear as weak and as broken as they really were, knowing that to appear sick or weak or injured, they would be seen as being no longer useful to the camp and would be sent to their deaths. The musicians themselves had complex feelings about those contributions. Some went on to have distinguished careers as musicians. Others never played again. The memory of making music in Auschwitz, of playing these schmaltzy, peppy marches while watching as their fellow prisoners at times, perhaps even including 
their own relatives were being marched to the gas chambers was too painful. So just from these few examples, we can see music provided a number of roles, the use and misuse of music during the Holocaust. It's just an insight to the complexity and diversity of experiences of the Holocaust. As I like to remind my students, the Holocaust is not a single story of six million Jewish deaths. It's six million different stories, many of which we'll never know but some of which we can come to know if we learn a little bit about the musicians and the music they made, and as we'll hear in just a few moments, the music they created during the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay, for providing the historical insight for us and also for possibly challenging, challenging our thinking to remember again the complexity to not try and homogenize the experience of, of the survivors. So thank you for that. Everybody, I, before I continue, I, it occurs to me, you may see in front of you or next to you these strange little earphones. They can amplify the sound of the mic as well. So if for whatever reason you're struggling to hear, this is a thing to put on and you'll be able to adjust the sound. If you need any help, just please indicate there are members of our team who will come and help you. It is my pleasure now to turn to our next panelist, Noreen Green. Noreen is the artistic director and conductor of the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony, which she founded in 1994. She also creates and leads an innovative outreach education program called A Patchwork of Cultures, Exploring, Exploring the Sephardic Latina Connection that has served more than a thousand elementary school students annually since 2006. Noreen holds a Master of Music degree from California State University, Northridge, and a Doctor of Musical Arts from the University of Southern California. Noreen has spoken and conducted in the United States, Israel, South Africa, Australia, Canada, and the Caribbean. We're very pleased to have you with us to here today, Noreen. Over to you. Thank you. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Why did I create the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony? Well, growing up Jewish, I was lucky. My family was not directly affected by the Holocaust. My grandparents emigrated here to the United States in the early 20th century due to the pogroms in Eastern Europe. My first real exposure to the power of music and its importance in remembering the Holocaust was my first professional conducting job with the American Jewish Choral Society. Every year we sang at the memorial of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and the choir were survivors, and families of those murdered by the Nazis. I saw firsthand the effect singing had on them. Guarded most of the time, they could let their tears flow freely while singing. The same was true of the audience. It affected me deeply as a young 20-year-old. A few years later, for my doctoral dissertation, I chose to write my treatise on the composer of David Novikovsky. He was a composer in the early 1900s and was considered the Bach of Odessa. Through my research, I learned that his music was listed on Hitler's hit list, one of the most notorious publications in the world of Nazi musicology. Herbert Gerig's Lexicon der Juden in der Musik. And I have the quote, if we can put it up on the board. He states, the purification of all culture and thus also our musical culture of all Jewish elements has been successful. Clear legal restrictions have ensued, ensured, I'm sorry, have ensured that in Germany the Jew is not publicly active in the cultural sphere, not as musician or composer, not as writer or publisher or businessman. The lexicon, as you can see, der Muden in der Musik is up there. I've also put the page of Novikovsky's name on there. He was in good company, Mendelssohn, Mahler, Offenbach, Meyerbeer, and more. This lexicon uh, is rumored that it was supposed to be in a museum for extinct people. After receiving my doctorate, I founded the LA Jewish Symphony with a mission to 
performed music of the Jewish experience, of course, curating many programs to highlight composers who wrote on Holocaust themes, those that were murdered, those that survived, and also by contemporary composers who are inspired by their stories. Music was a lifeline, as James said, a way to feel human for those living through the Holocaust, to lift themselves out of the horrific circumstances they were experiencing. Several programmatic themes emerged and solidified my commitment to performing Holocaust-related repertoire. And I think each of us who delve into this repertoire, and there are many people across the country who do this, Recovered Voices is one of them by James Collin. The composers and their inspiration allow us to look into history, into that time period. Those that survived can tell their stories, but they won't be here for much longer, but their music will be. They will be here long after they are gone. It is their art that survives and can tell their stories for generations. Each generation of musicians, my generation, your generation, the next generation has a moral obligation to keep their stories alive. And for composers, to create new music inspired by their stories that resonate with them. One of the composers I championed early in my career was Eric Zeisel, who wrote the first Requiem Ebraico in 1944. I say the first because I'm aware of several others that have been written since. Can we see Eric Zeisel? Zeisel's Requiem, and by the way, in Catholicism, Requiem is the mass for the dead, is dedicated to his parents and all the Jews exterminated in the Holocaust. Zeisel got out of Vienna the day after Kristallnacht, November 10th, 1938. He and his wife were on a plane. They made their way to Paris, and then they were able to secure a visa to Hollywood. I have a personal connection with Zeisel's music through his grandson, Randy Schoenberg. With the efforts of Randy, his music is being recorded and preserved and now receiving the recognition it deserves. Randy also introduced me to another composer, Vladislaw Spielmann. You probably recognize that name for the 2002 Oscar-winning film, The Pianist. He was also a composer, and I had the privilege of performing the world premiere of his piano concertino. Composed while he was hiding in the Warsaw Ghetto, he kept that manuscript with him. I learned recently from his son, Andre, that his story is being made into a Broadway musical. I'll be here for the premiere. I hope you'll see it, too. Spielmann was dubbed the Polish Gershwin and his piano concertino certainly confirms that depiction. I expected it to be dark and full of angst. He wrote it while he was hiding in the Warsaw Ghetto, but it's not. It's a jazzy, uplifting piece, much like the Rhapsody in Blue. Sadly, Spielmann died before the premiere, but his son was there. It was my honor to also perform the concertino at the premiere of the movie several years later. What is it like to perform this music? I feel a huge responsibility, a weight of obligation that is really indescribable, and a sense of satisfaction when the musicians and I present this music. We're like on this journey. We learn the music, we learn their stories, and then we present it to the audience. You can feel the audience have an emotional response to the stories of the composers by listening to their music. Another composer's story that reinforced, reinforced my commitment to performing music of the Holocaust was Herbert Zipper. His life history was told in the book by Paul Cummings. Composer Herbert Zipper and playwright Yuri Zoifer were arrested in 1938 and sent to Dachau. You heard a little bit about what it was like in Dachau. Zoifer and Zipper wrote Dachau Lied in September 1938 as an ironic response to the motto Arbat mach frei, work makes you free, which is inscribed on the gates of the entrance to the camp and what they had to walk under before they went to work and what they had to walk under on their way back. Initially performed in secret in that latrine that James was talking about, Dachau Sam was eventually learned by many camp inmates. Both Seufer and Zipper believed that exercising the intellect helped preserve a prisoner's self-respect in the face of constant humiliation. According to Zipper, he and his co-author made Dachau's song 
deliberately difficult to learn and sing, hoping that challenge would help their comrades rise above their surroundings. Weeks after composing the song, the two men were transferred to Buchenwald, where Seufer died from typhoid fever at age 26. Zipper was ransomed by his family, fled to Paris, and then to the Philippines, where he served as conductor of the Manila Symphony. Then the Japanese invaded, and he was interned again. After World War II, Zipper immigrated to the United States, working as a conductor, composer, and music educator in my hometown of Los Angeles until his death at 92 in 1997. It is the legacy of music and songs from the Holocaust that carries the proof of our victory over the Nazis, the power of human survival to continue living and overcome trauma and genocide, and the power of music to exist beyond any act of evil. I quote Zipper. They tore off our belongings, deprived us of food and clothing, but music is the one thing that they could not take away from us, music that evil could not destroy. As a parent, my choices for repertoire had been to focus on how music was part of the hope for survival and to shine a spotlight on the righteous people who, at the risk of their own lives, lend a helping hand. When I curate a program, I think, what do I want to tell my kids? How do I want to educate the next generation? And so the LA Jewish Symphony is also committed to performing music of the Holocaust and creating curriculum to be presented in the schools. Some of my program titles have been Triumph of the Spirit, Gesher Lechayim, which means Bridge to Life, Remembrances from Darkness to Light, where in the first half of the program we talk about the Holocaust, and then the second half we talk about the music of Israel, our light. In Israel, everybody's affected by the Holocaust. They've had friends or family or relatives that were affected. The, Israel is our light. We must keep alive. We say never forget. What better way to keep memory alive than the heartfelt compositions, the artwork, the poetry, which inspired the creative spirit even though their bodies were suffering unimaginable horrors, their spirits could soar over the barbed wire. No one can crush the imagination. I'll say it again. It is our moral obligation as musicians, as conductors, as composers to preserve the legacy of the music of the Holocaust and pass it on to the following generations so that the victims will not be forgotten. I'd like to end my talk by singing the chorus of Dach Lied. Doch wir haben die Losen von Dachau gelernt und wir würden stahlhart dabei. Bleib bei Mensch, Kamerad, sein ein Mann, Kamerad, mach ganze Arbeit, packen, Kamerad, denn Arbeit und Arbeit macht frei. But we all learned the motto of Dachau to heed and became as hard in a stone. Stay humane, Dachau mate, be a man, Dachau mate, and work as hard as you can, Dachau mate, for work leads to freedom alone. Sing with me. For work leads to freedom alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noreen, for that very stirring reflection. It is my pleasure now to turn to our next panelists, and you will see and hear soon why I am introducing them together. I begin with Victoria Bond, sitting next to me. Victoria is a composer and conductor. She was the first woman awarded a doctorate in orchestral conducting from the Juilliard School in New York. Victoria served as Exxon Arts Endowment Conductor with the Pittsburgh Symphony and as guest conductor throughout the United States, Europe, South America, and China. Victoria produces the annual Cutting Edge Concerts New Music Festival in New York and is a frequent lecturer for the Metropolitan Opera Guild. Her commissions include the American Ballet Theater, and the Houston and Shanghai Symphony Orchestras. Her compositions have been performed by the Dallas Symphony, New York City Opera, Irish National Orchestra, and the Shanghai Symphony. 
We're delighted and deeply grateful that Victoria has composed a piece specially for the 27th of January 2023 United Nations uh, Memorial C Ceremony. And we are delighted that today you'll be able to hear a preview. Our other panelist is Rene Yoles. Rene is a violinist with an eclectic career as soloist and chamber artist who has performed in major concert halls and festivals throughout Europe, Asia, North and South Americas. She is a member of Continuum, Intimate Voices, the Bedford Chamber Players, the New York Chamber Ensemble, and a concertmaster of the Grammy Award-winning Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Renee is a professor of violin at the Eastman School of Music, where she inaugurated the annual Holocaust Remembrance Concert series in 2014. Prior to that, she was on the faculty of the Juilliard School, pre-college division, the Mann School of Music, preparatory division, and the Aaron Copland School of Music at Queen's College. Renee earned her Bachelor of Music and Master of Music degrees from the Juilliard School. It is our pleasure to welcome you both, and we give you the floor. Thank you so much, Tracy, for asking myself and Renee to be part of this very, very moving moment. And my reaction to, to this is a piece of music which I composed specifically for this occasion and, as you said, January 27th. And my piece for solo violin, and I am the most fortunate person in the world to have one of the great violinists of our time, Renee Jollis, playing this, um, is based on a poem, a poem that I have known for many, many years, and I find very moving because it is um, addressed to a young child. It's by the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, and uh, it is called Spring and Fall to a Young Child. And I can do no better than actually reciting the poem to you. It's very short. Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? Leaves, like the things of man, you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? Ah, as the heart grows older, it will come to such sights colder by and by. Nor spare a sigh, the worlds of one wood leaf mill will lie, and yet you will weep and know why. Now, no matter child the name, sorrow's springs are the same. No, nor mouth had no, nor mind expressed what heart heard of, ghost guessed. It is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret you mourn for. Now, Tracy had asked me about the creative process, and I thought perhaps it would be interesting for you to see how that poem was translated, at least the first line, Margaret, are you grieving, into music. So I've asked Renee if she could play the theme of this. This is a set of variations on this theme, and um, I've asked Renee if she could play one of the variations before she plays the whole piece. Renee's tuning, that was not the variation. <laughs> The variation follows.
Thank you. Now we're on. Thank you so much, Renee. And now she'll play the whole piece for you, which is not very long.
I think I need to take a few minutes. I'm sure you do too. That was extraordinarily powerful. And I'm sure you'll agree with me how wonderful it is that we were able to hear that piece performed for the first time and a preview. And I'm sure that you will agree that it will be quite an extraordinary contribution to the United Nations commemoration um, uh, marking the International Day of Commemoration in Memory of the Victims of the Holocaust. And I do hope that you will be able to join us in the General Assembly Hall on the 27th of January, 2023, when we will have the premiere of that extraordinary piece. I, I am sure that you have questions, uh, comments, and I would love us to use uh, of the time that is remaining for us to, 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 to have a conversation. I welcome also our panelists. If you would like to ask your fellow musicians, your historian questions, we do that as well. For those who are in the room and would like to ask a question, if I could ask you to raise your hand. Um, Yu Hung very kindly is, is going to, will bring a, a microphone to you. You hung, I see someone's hand over there. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Do you prefer that I read this? Th Thank you very much for this. Um, my name is Avital Rosenberg. I'm the. Can hear me. I'm sorry, yeah, I, I think sit. it's, it's uh, thank you for be standing, but yes, it's actually easier if you speak up. Yeah. My name is Avital Rosenberg, I'm, um, I represent the delegation of Israel to the UN. Uh, I'm the representative covering uh, the third committee which deals with human rights uh, and um, the culture of peace and anti-Semitism under it as well. Uh, I just wanted, the, I'm making this statement <laughs> not in a national capacity or not something that uh, I made in advance, but just really acknowledging this very important um, and very interesting panel. Um, you know, I think uh, we, we all have some kind of memory, some kind of story, and you mentioned all the different stories. Um, it always makes me very uh, <laughs> emotional. Uh, my uh, my husband's father uh, was is is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, he was two years old when he was separated from his family, probably in Transnistria. So that brings me back there every time. Um, on my on my side of the family as well, uh, many family members of my great grandfather were killed in Treblinka. Um, and as a representative of the State of Israel, it always shows me the importance of the need to always remember, never forget. And especially nowadays, when we see the anti-Semitism soar around the world, really having th this opportunity to take an hour out of our day on this very important date um, and have thought and emotion dedicated to the remembrance. So I thank you for really this very interesting uh, and important event. And of course, we will be there on the 27th, and we will be honored to listen to the piece in the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. I, am, I, I apologize, everyone. I confused myself and everybody else. If you are sitting down below, <laughs> which I think everybody is, then uh, you just have to push the button. We'll come around and help you if you wish to ask a question. Um, anybody else would like to? Yes, I just want to um, acknowledge this is Sharon Douglas. Uh, she has been very involved in, in helping me organize today's panel. So just, just to acknowledge Sharon. Over to you, Sharon. Uh, which one do I push? Oh, perfect. OK, I'm perfect. Uh, I'm Sharon Douglas, I'm the CEO of the Anne Frank Center for the United States. And so my question to the panel is, how did the German people who loved Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms reconcile the love of music and civilization with the lack of humanity in the relation to Jews, Romas, 
and challenged people, for me, this is the essential question of the Holocaust. And I pose it to the, to the panel. Um, thank you, Sharon, uh, for that thoughtful question. I think um, we have to remember that the Nazis were trying to purify for the Aryan race. So Beethoven and Brahms were of their race. And so, of course, they extolled that music. However, the music of Mendelssohn and other Jews and people from other races didn't live up to their standard of what is a pure race, what, is, what I showed you, the lexicon, it was about the purification of their society all across the board, music, poetry, art. They wanted to purify the race, and that's um, what sends chills up my spine and what is still happening today. And that's why it's so important for us to always remember and to never forget. Press the button. Lower left. There's a little button there you press. Lower left. Lower left. Sorry, it was covered. <laughs> Sorry. Um, certainly music was intrinsic to the German people and still is. Uh, Victoria and I had a conversation where when you go on a Lufthansa plane, there are six channels of beautiful classical music. Um, and it seems that this love of music and uh, discriminating against who was allowed to produce music and play music during the Holocaust was just art rendering. And for you, uh, Noreen, I'd like to ask you, um, I understand that you performed a concert with the Violins of Hope. How was that, and what was it like? Uh, so I, I had the very uh, great honor of actually uh, witnessing what it was like for the musicians to hold these violins. If you haven't read James' book um, about the Violins of Hope, these are violins that were uh, rescued and restored by an Israeli luthier and um, are now going around the world touring. And it's wonderful to, to um, perform this music on these violins, perform any music on these violins, because it's a, a, a non-threatening way to learn about the Holocaust. The violins tell their stories. Rather, you know, it, it's, it's a little less um, emotional. But when you play the violin, it becomes a hugely emotional experience. I'm not a, a violinist, but I was at the session where my concert master, uh, Mark Hasper, uh, had to choose the violin that he wanted to play for the concert. And listening to him play all these different violins and reading the story of how they survived the Holocaust and how they came to Israel to be restored was extraordinary, and each violin had its own voice. I don't know how he chose, but somehow he chose a violin, and he said, this is the one I want to play. And then we had all the violins there for the orchestra to choose backstage. And I remember the musicians, and some were Jewish, some were not Jewish, going around and, and, and picking up the violins and playing with them. And one of the members of my orchestra picked up a violin started to play it, it gets very emotional, and she started to cry. And she looked at the story of the violin, and the violin survived from Czechoslovakia, and she was from Czechoslovakia, and she happened to pick up that violin, and that was the violin that she played during the concert. It's very powerful, very powerful stuff. Um, before we go to the gentleman that I see here, um, I wanted to ask um, Rene, uh, when you, it's a naive question, I'm not a musician, so don't laugh, but when you are playing, does it matter for you the backstory of the piece of music? So, you know, knowing that Victoria had composed this thinking about um, the Holocaust commemoration, does that matter or do you approach each piece of music as it stands on its own? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that 
it both matters and doesn't. I think that, that one can play a piece of music simply by studying the piece on its own, and you don't necessarily need to know the backstory, but when you do know the backstory, it enhances your view of the piece and, and certain things in it you start to view as tone painting or bringing out certain elements of the piece. And so when uh, Victoria and I got together a few weeks ago after she had written the piece, uh, one of the things that we did was we looked at the poem together and she explained to me why it was uh, so significant to her and really what she felt that it meant. And, and uh, I think that was extremely helpful for me. Uh, it was still, I looked at the piece ahead of time and it was still a beautiful piece, but that really helped to just coalesce all my ideas and, and bring it together. Good afternoon, my name is Farooq. Uh, today is the Holy Coast, he is the arranged this meeting. I'm so glad to pull to his the Holy Cross and nice panel panel and all those his the participator here. Thank you so much. The mic uh, music is the make a pitch of the world. So music is a great thing. So my question is the James, the if we have a last his the big horrible his a disaster in the pandemic, right? The how could be he, the uh, Holy Cross providing the music in the whole world, and how they are dependent, how is they created the Holy Cross in the about pandemic they can do something about the music you know every every I think so human being everyone like the music, that's the real things, so my question is the Mr. James is the panelist how could be this. Uh, disaster pandemic, whole, uh, whole world is the inflation, is the pandemic. So what they should be do is the, for Holy Coast is the, this pandemic. Uh, I, I think I give the one example. I am Bangladeshi. So 1971, we are uh, independent. So that times is the, we have a big disaster in Bangladesh. That times is the Harrison, he is the die, he is the pathway. Harrison is the do the big uh, concert in the uh, Madison Square Garden, and this is the helpful for Bangladesh. So these kind of things, Holy Cross, what should we do? Thank you so much, panelists and everyone. Yes, yeah, thank you for that question. I think it is a really interesting thing, I guess, as a musician, as a historian, how music can bring us together. You know, and that's why I think even in Mankind's Darkest Hour, people continue to hold on to their music and hold on to their identities, and that's what gives us hope. That certainly gave many people hope during the Holocaust. So I, I appreciate that question. I think it is uh, very important for us uh, to remember, you know, they say music is the international language, and that's a problematic statement because, of course, every culture has its own language and has its own type of music. But certainly the overarching thought of that is that the idea of music making is a quintessentially human activity and something that can bring us all together. If I may, if I may just jump in. Um, there was a quote on the bulletin board of the, the Warsaw, War, Warsaw Ghetto Symphony Orchestra, <laughs> which read, um, music is more important than bread, especially at times when it is not needed at all. That for, that, for me, just says it right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Sorry. Please allow me to take off my mask at the time of the intervention. My name is Veronica Sabag. I'm the founder and chair of United Voices for Peace, an organization fostering a universal culture of peace through music and the arts. Uh, we have chosen uh, this form of communication, believing it is definitely a very powerful one. So I would like, first of all, to thank the panelists and uh, also uh, the Department of Global Communication for organizing this panel. 
Um, unfortunately, as we have heard, also anti-Semitism is still a challenge today. And uh, we believe that we have still to look for creative and meaningful ways uh, to address this, cha this challenge. Uh, and music for us is definitely a very, uh, a very effective way of doing so. So I would like to take uh, this opportunity to uh, draw your attention to a program that our organization has launched called uh, Death Metal Grama, a non-conventional call for social justice. Uh, we cannot ignore the impact that music has in the young generations. We need to look for ways to engage these generations on this, cha on this challenge and on this problem. Unfortunately, as you know, I mean, uh, the survivors are leaving us, and among all the stories, we decided to shed light on the story of Inge Ginsberg, a very daring and different, I would say, a very original Holocaust survivor, a composer that was very famous in Hollywood uh, in the 50s. And she decided at the age of 93 to create a rock band. Uh, so, yes, I know is uh, very different, but it happens to be a very effective way to communicate with young generations. So we've been presenting a documentary about her life in Europe, where it is much needed, in uh, the US, in Mexico, online, and uh, the musicians and ourselves are, are available for presenting this program with uh, screenings and also opportunity to meet the musicians. Unfortunately... Okay. I'm uh, sorry, ma'am. Very... No, no. Just I'm, a I'm, short... We, we have to end... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, very short note. Very quick. Uh, ironically, uh, Inge was born on the 27th of January, <laughs> and uh, uh, she left us last year, but uh, we launched an NFT collection called NFT... Uh, Death Metal Grammar NFT Collection, again, to raise awareness of the young generation of uh, her legacy and her lyrics. Thank you. And I'm sorry to have spoken over you. I'm very glad that you managed to get that sentence in. Thank you very much. And, and it does indeed sound like a fascinating project. We've had a question from um, Michael Polgar, which asks about are there educational recommendations for working, for teaching about the Holocaust through a musical instrument? We're going to leave the question there, not try and answer it now, Michael, but we will send when we will we will get an answer to you and we will share that with everyone. Believe it or not, our time actually has come to an end. I want to acknowledge one survivor I do know who is with us, and, and please forgive me if there are other survivors who I don't know you are here, but sitting straight ahead of me is Miss Irene Shasha. She spoke at, in the General Assembly in January of 2020. And it's wonderful, Irene, that you find the time to be with us today. And I know that you're dying to talk to us, but I'm going to ask you to keep it very, very short because, unfortunately, we have to, to leave the room. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for inviting me. I come all the way from Israel, landed New York 24 hours ago, and it, I happen to uh, have connected with Tracy. Um, and she invited me on this occasion uh, to be present and join you in this very, very memorable, at least to me, uh, reunion. Uh, I am a survivor, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. And my father, the one thing he took with him from Spulna, the street where I was born and from where we were thrown into the ghetto, was his violin. He was killed 
in the Warsaw Ghetto. And with him went the violin. Didn't have much of a chance to use it for too long. I was invited on January 27, 2020 by the United Nations to present my testimony. And it was the peak of my survival. As a result, just 10 days ago, I wrote a book for children. And the book says, I warn against Hitler. Thank you. Irene, thank you so much. Once again, a very meaningful intervention, and we appreciate that you are here with us. When we mark the November pogrom, we think about the pain and terror that children, men and women had to endure. We think about the bewilderment and growing anxiety as they were turned away by country after country. Those governments turned their backs not only on those seeking asylum, but on the obvious acts of atrocity being committed by the Nazis and their racist collaborators. As we remember the past and learn about it, let us ask ourselves, with such knowledge, what is our responsibility? The United Nations Refugee Agency reports that at the end of 2021, the total number of people worldwide who were forced to flee their homes due to conflicts, violence, fear of persecution and human rights violations was 89.3 million. This is more than double the people who were forcibly displaced a decade ago and the most since the Second World War. Are we supporting enough the efforts of those who engage with responding to the plight of refugees today? Are we holding accountable those who can change the conditions that force people to flee their homes? What more can we do? We leave you with these questions and thank you so much for engaging with us as we mark the November 1938 pogrom. We thank, and I'm sure you will join me, our esteemed panel for the extraordinary contribution you've made. And we ask you kindly, before you leave, to please take the survey. It helps us do our jobs better. We have paper copies for those of you who have pens. Pens. <laughs> um, or else you can type, it should be up on the screen now. Yeah. Um, type the link or use your cell phones in your browser and um, you can scan the QR code and take the, the survey online. And if you do wish to do a paper version, please, uh, Johang will bring it to you, just let her know. Uh, and we will also sur send the survey out again. So don't worry if you couldn't, you forgot your pen, your cell phone battery has died. It's not the end of the world. Uh, we are very grateful that you've made the time to be with us. We thank all of those of you who have taken the time to join us online. There were a number of comments on Slido. We acknowledge the thanks that you gave our panel on Slido, and we hope and wish all of you a safe and healthy end of the year we are approaching. So as soon as you have done, thank you so much. This brings our uh, event today to an end. We are, those of you who are looking on our website, we have placed our theme for 2023, which is home and belonging, as well as the events already that we can confirm for the January-February period. We'll also be sending out a MailChimp later this afternoon so that you can begin to plan. And we look forward 
to welcoming you when we next see you. Thank you so much, everybody. Go safe. Keep well.